Right, so there's a couple of items in the news today, uh, which which one of them has been in the news for quite a while now, which is um, the Brexit, as it's so called, the UK referendum, and will we, won't we go out, you know, come the vote in June? I did predict the vote in June uh, would happen then. Uh, it's now been said that is when it's going to happen. So the Prime Minister David Cameron's campaigning to stay in Europe, um, even though he's the one that's arranged for the vote to happen. Um, and there's a couple of other pieces of news today. There's the Didcot power station collapsed. Um, some people are calling it an explosion. I'm not sure it is that. That sounds like um, maybe a bit of embellishment there. Um, and the doctors, strikes and so on. Um, so the UK Prime Minister David Cameron says the deal he got from the EU after all night sessions in early to mid-February 2016, so that's just a few probably days ago, is fixed. Michael Gove, the Lord Chancellor and Secretary of State for Justice, uh, who's in his own cabinet, in the Prime Minister David Cameron's cabinet in the UK, uh, says the treaty needs change, the European treaty needs change to give this deal force of law. Uh, a government minister, uh, I'm not sure he's a government minister, he's certainly an MP, Dominic Grieve QC, Queen's Council, so he's another lawyer in government, half of them are. Um, he's an MP for Beaconsfield, which is Tory Heartland if anywhere is, um, said that the day after the EU referendum, the UK votes in favour of remaining, then this deal is in force, which is, it's interesting that he makes this discrimination that wasn't made before. This very categoric and specific statement that we are, if we vote to stay in as the UK, if we vote to stay in Europe, then we, we will have this deal in force the day after we vote to stay in. Uh, that sounds a bit like if we vote the correct way, uh, they'll think, the Europeans will think about making the deal firm. That's really a slight difference in stance to what the Prime Minister's come back with, that is, it's a legally binding agreement. I suppose he felt he had to say something to justify those all-nighters and all this strain on the media and so on, all the emphasis. Uh, Boris Johnson, MP and still nominally Mayor of London, uh, pending a vote this year, is now against his old Bullingdon Club uh, friend, that is the Prime Minister, uh, and advocates departing from the EU. Um, a lot of people think this is mainly to feather his own nest because they think that he really wants to be Prime Minister to have that top notch on his CV. Uh, and in his calculation, it's the best posture to adopt until the EU referendum vote in the UK is decided one way or the other. And maybe he's got a plan that he'll look as though he's persuaded to stay in after all if Britain looks as though it's going to shape up that way to vote to stay in. I have said elsewhere that to two decimal places I have predicted, I think it's fair to say in advance of anybody else, I have predicted the vote even before the date was announced when the vote was going to be, I predicted the vote by basing it on essentially the Scottish independence vote by saying all the fundamentals are the same. So that turns out to mean 55.30% of people voting in Britain, in the UK, um, would vote to stay in, remain part of Europe, and 44.70% would vote to get out. And there's another piece on that, uh, based, and it's all based on the fundamentals and the fact it's incredibly similar to the, the Scottish independence vote, and the demographics are roughly the same. So, um, But the two people left outside the current wave of, pu wave of publicity are Theresa May, who is the Home Secretary, which means Secretary of State in, in UK. Uh, so the Home Secretary deals with law and order and stuff like that. And they've split that off now from the Justice Minister, which kind of deals with stuff like prisons and so on. But Theresa May does sort of the bit to do with MI5, you know, the secret agency of the British government and so on, uh, and the police and all that. Uh, and George Osborne, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, both these ardent Tories are um, very close to Prime Minister in his cabinet. 
state ministers and they are very important um, front runners as well for the leadership. Uh, but they are staying with David Cameron, saying they, they that remaining in the EU is the best place for Britain to be. Uh, they haven't made a big splash recently in terms of publicity. Maybe that's their calculation in terms of where they want to be positioned later. Uh, next general election is 2020. And what I'm really saying now is that uh, David Cameron is going to, uh, to me, predicting four months of unravelling aggravation in the Tory party. Uh, David Cameron may well at least have a contingency plan for leaving right after the EU referendum in the UK. Uh, it's quite a strain being the Prime Minister. He'll never beat either Margaret Thatcher's record or uh, Tony Blair's record, who beat Margaret Thatcher by a few months or something, uh, for staying in the longest in the office. So it's it's not about something like that. It's just about when he thinks the best, judi most judicious moment is to leave. Uh, Jeremy Hunt might have been in the running. He's uh, the health secretary, but he's made such a barney with the doctors, which are, are a well-loved part of British society. Uh, the doctors are now going to have three strikes. Jeremy Hunt used to be in education, the education secretary. Uh, he succeeded Michael Gove in doing that. Uh, and, and basically Jeremy Hunt upset everyone in education. Now he's going about upsetting the doctors in health. Uh, so that they're going to go on strike several times. Uh, so now um, he's a toxic brand. Anywhere he goes seems to be a massive issue and there's going to be a fight. Uh, and he's now quoted as saying some figures that might be wrong and nobody can find a justification for him saying that 6,000 people die at weekends that didn't die uh, in, in hospitals because he says there's not proper seven-day working of the British doctors. So... You know, he said things like that that are quite upsetting to people and would have to be true for you to go and say them. And people are now saying they can't really, burrowing away and with freedom of information requests, the BBC are saying they can't find the justification for this. Okay. Um, so the doctors are a cadre of the most well-liked people and professionals in British public life. It's, it's incredibly stupid to pick a fight with them unless you really have a strong basis for doing so. Um, you know, government minister versus doctors, you know, the British public would be clear that the doctors would win out in that kind of contest. It's not a contest. Nonetheless, Jeremy Hunt's decided to go the full 10 rounds or whatever. Um, the question that floats to the surface is, uh, does this uh, EU referendum, what's the deal moment, does the issue have much more explosive capacity to rupture the Tory party than it does to do anything really to make a new deal stick in the EU uh, or swing the vote in the EU referendum? Does this deal, so-called, that Cameron's made uh, have the capacity to swing the vote? If it's not really legally binding, I'm not sure it does, but they'll argue about that till the cows come home. As in the Scottish independence referendum, loads of big questions just never got settled. And I think what's more, the British public actually doesn't expect them to be settled. People are going to make up their mind based on their gut feeling of, of where their situation is and that most of these won't be settled satisfactorily either way before the referendum takes place. You'll know all about it afterward. It'll take months or years for it to unravel or to go well. Um, and that's uh, the 23rd of June this year is the EU referendum vote. Um, now, David Cameron, I think, might be thinking, if there's a big rupture in the party, it's better for me to leave on the premise I don't have the support of all my party than to hang on and wait for the knives to go in at some point, indeterminate point, after the EU referendum vote, um, not knowing precisely when the will choose to actually stick the knife in his back. So it might be better for him to go after the EU vote, no matter which way it goes. And I've got a feeling... Unless he loves the strain and stress of being the British Prime Minister, I've got the feeling that David Cameron not only might have a contingency plan for leaving either way after the EU vote, whether we vote to remain in or decide to come out of the EU, um, he might leave anyway. So, thinking about it, he could legitimately leave after the referendum, no shame apportioned, no matter which way it goes, uh, and he could stay on only to find that his deal doesn't turn out half as good as he thought it was going to be, and I'm not sure how good he thinks it is going to be, um, or he could go out 
uh, at, at times so of his own choosing. I was saying that the Prime Minister could legitimately leave after the referendum, no matter which way it goes. Um, does he want to stay in long enough for them to put the knives in whenever they feel like it? Waiting for a moment when he's weak? Or is this a big enough moment where he could leave no matter which way the vote goes? So if it goes in favour of his so-called deal, uh, he could leave, and then if it all unravels, he doesn't. He's not going to be imposed to take the blame. And a lot of the strains off him. Somebody else has to implement it. You know, it's a bit like an architect designing a building, but not hanging around until they actually build the thing. Um, and then there's the issue of let's say Britain, the UK votes against staying in the EU, so we vote to leave the European Union. That's a massive extraction. So the actual thing of implementing that, the effort and the project of doing that, there's not many people who would like to be involved with that because there's lots of room for that to go wrong. The, the, the fact is the safety shot for everybody is to stay in. I don't think we should stay in. Um, I think there should be indictments, charges laid against the, um, the, the European officials and politicians that created Schengen and the Euro, two massive projects that they completely screwed up. And if there were indictments and charges, I would actually vote to stay in the EU because then it would be a, 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 an enterprise I could get behind. But the fact we're not going to hold these people to account because, you know, Macedonia now, people are crawling over the, um, the razor wire and so on and cutting the razor wire and just walking into Macedonia from Greece. Uh, with not a shot fired. Now, I'm not saying it'd be a good thing to fire shots, but I'm saying you won't stop these kind of people unless you do something fairly serious. You would physically have to stop them. How you would do that, I don't really know. I mean, maybe it comes down to shooting. I, I'm not advocating it. What I'm saying is that if it's got to the stage it's got to, and with the kind of people who are on your border, you're not going to stop them by asking them nicely. They're not Europeans. It's, it's completely, you're dealing with completely different people. You're either going to physically stop them or they won't be stopped. We shouldn't have got here in the first place. But having said that we're here, you either decide you have a border or you decide you don't. Right. So that, that's my point of view about that. Um, the PM, therefore, uh, David Cameron, really, maybe you should just from his own selfish point of view, should think this is a suitable big thing happening that he could go either way at the end of it. Uh, another thing that's on the news um, is the um, uh, the doctor strikes, new 48-hour strikes over the next uh, couple of months. Um, legal action being taken to try and stop Jeremy Hunt, who, as I've already mentioned, is now a toxic brand. Um, and not very well respected and if he's told some lies about how people have died at the weekends when they really haven't uh, and NHS England aren't exactly backing him up they say there's another study come out that shows things are even worse than he said but of course that's not the point when he said what he said that there were 6,000 people dead that didn't need to be um, was that correct based on evidence or did he just go and spout it and now in effect they've had to go and produce a bit of research to um, Trump even those figures, but the reason they've done it is to back up the Secretary of uh, Secretary for Health, the Health Secretary. Um, you know, it, it sounds like they've done it back to front. He's gone and said some figures, then you've gone and got some research to prove it. Uh, and like I said, if it's between the doctors, a showdown between the doctors uh, and some government minister who's already proved to be toxic in education, um, well, what can I say? He's only really got the likes of the police to move on to and then he'll, you know, he'll really have the whole clutch of services that we respect and rely on um, to screw up. He'll, he'll have got the whole lot then, full set. Don't know. I don't think he's going to win this, uh, even if he managed to impose somehow the uh, contract. I think, in effect, in the end, he'll still lose. Um... There's been this Didcot explosion or collapse. It looks like more like a collapse. It looks burned out, but it was a coal power station. It's in Oxfordshire, down in the southern uh, edge near the border of Oxfordshire. Um, pictures that show it. There was a lot of noise, apparently. One guy was out with his dogs. 
Um, the dogs apparently were playing around like crazy. Now, you might say, what's that got to do with these things? Dogs can hear things we can't hear. And they might hear things in advance of what humans can hear. So the guy in the field opposite where the power station was, it may not be captured on video, and it may not be that we fully understand it, but the dogs, I think, knew in advance that something was up. And uh, so they're running around like crazy. It might be something to do with that. If there was some screeching and tremors in the girders and stuff, the dogs might know this in advance. Uh, I'm not really sure, but I think you're going to find it's a family called the Coleman family who um, run this particular demolition company. They've been working on it since 2013, I think. That's when the, the Didcot Power Station was first being decommissioned. Uh, and at the end of this year, it has to be finished this year, this decommissioning, this uh, demolition job. So the big cooling towers, those familiar uh, bobbin-shaped cooling towers, there were six of them, and some of them have been demolished already. And this is a girder-type structure. Um, and half of it's now collapsed. And there's, there's one person dead, five in hospital, and three are missing. Now, if anyone's watching this who is part of the family, I apologise in advance for the blunt nature of what I'm going to say. Uh, the three are missing. So I'm giving a pause here. If you don't want to be here, go away. Uh, and, and that's out of respect. Um, the three who are missing probably have to be dead because there would have been some noise or something by now. Now we're, what, 12 hours after? We're more like 16 hours after it occurred. It occurred yesterday afternoon, the 23rd. Uh, of February 2016 so you know there's been loads of rescue workers there for half a day or more overnight and, and they've got dogs and everything and they haven't found anybody uh, so it's quite possible that these people are dead underneath that um, it's not rubble exactly it's more like a bunch of girders and stuff um, there's only two ways to blow to, to get something down uh, I don't know a lot about demolition but there's two ways to get it down uh, it can involve explosives, or you can physically dismantle it. Uh, there are, to me, there are two schools of thought. Um, it reminds me of when I was replacing windows in a property, and I keep seeing people. They take a hammer to windows, smash it out, loads of glass. It falls two stories down, whole hellish mess. Um, I managed to take the windows out of the property I was working on without smashing anything. I literally took the glass out, carefully manhandled it inside the house set it down carefully outside and then I unscrewed the empty window frames and then I put the new frames in and there's no smashing and no dramatic stuff so I don't know why people do it um, that is a very small scale thing I understand that it's not the scale of demolition but what you seem to have is a mechano set here and if you're going to weld and there are some photographs which clearly show welding work has gone on in the demolition process they are literally girders that have bits missing in the middle. Um, if you're going to weld bits off or unscrew bolts that hold the thing together, obviously this needs to be done incredibly carefully. Look, all I would say is this. They may be a skilled demolition team, but there are two important things here. One, they are working in, in a situation where they have a time scale. And I suspect that that time scale has got... Uh, incentives for them to finish early. Uh, there's probably penalties if they finish late and incentives if they finish early. Uh, Coleman, the company's been around for quite a while as a demolition company. I'm probably making too much of a guess here, but I'm going to just say this. This deal is quite a big deal for them, and if they finish it early, they'll get more money, and probably someone's going to retire. Maybe old man Coleman's going to retire on the back of it. Young family's going to take it over. Young girl family's going to take it over. I mean, I don't know, I'm making a wild guess, but there's a lot of that about at the moment. Um, and you want to take with you a decent retirement fund and give your kids a decent start, kids, you know, to be 30 or 40 years old. Um, so the problem becomes they are over-incentivized, perhaps, to get this finished early uh, and not minded to go as cautiously as they might. Uh, and the issue is that when you're dismantling something like this, you may be an expert in demolition, but in effect, you need to be more or less up to architect level in order to take such a place down safely if you're just going to do it by undoing nuts and bolts and oxyacetylene torch cutting through beams. You would literally need to dismantle it in almost 
as strenuous a way as it was put together and as careful a way. And it won't be designed for dismantling. It'll be designed to be built and stay up. The only way to do it is to take chunks off it from the top and drop them to the ground. If somebody wanted to do it in a hurry, and I come back to the incentives they may be under or penalties they may be under, uh, depending on how quickly they finish this, you, you may be tempted to undo a couple of major nuts and bolts and cut a couple of major girders and in your mind when you've done a certain amount of that you'll then blow the place down or half of it down or a third of it down. The trouble is you could be halfway through that and the building just collapses. My guess is that that's where this has happened. This is how this has happened. They've taken off a bit of a bigger chunk than maybe they perhaps should have. Instead of doing smaller chunks at a time, they look, maybe they've gone for a third or a half of it, and maybe that, in retrospect, and it's totally in retrospect, um, maybe you couldn't see in advance that was bad, but in retrospect, you will be able to see that that's what the problem was. There's not much to it. Either the, the blowing up of it with explosives went wrong, or the dismantling of it went wrong. I'm afraid that's, that's pretty much all there is to it. One other thing that's in the news, fourth item, is uh, the GM food experiment. The genetically modified crops. Britain, it turns out, is anti-genetic modification to crops. And of course that gets eaten by cattle and then we get it. Uh, I don't think it's that big a deal. I think it's probably relatively safe. But that's not the point. The point is, we've been reassured for decades that GM will be alright. Uh, that it's all under control and we won't get it if we don't ask for it and uh, wheat blowing into other fields, GM modified wheat blowing into non-modified fields won't happen because they've taken loads of precautions, blah, blah, blah. Now it turns out it's just in the food chain, so there. Uh, great. So that is what we call an experiment. That is experimenting on human beings that didn't want to be experimented on. So if ever you wanted a lesson in corporate bullshit, uh, this is it. I'm not saying it's that dangerous. I'm, I'm not sure it is that dangerous. But it rather shows the whole outlook of corporate mindset. Um, we've done it, so there. It's too late to do anything about it. You could try punishing us, but what's the point? And, you know, it's, I've just put here, it leads to almost zero control over the hidden content of what enters the food chain in any given country. The globalization of food industry, of major industries, including the food industry, has meant they're pretty much going to do what they like, and you'll end up with it whatever country you're in. Because people can't really trace that easily where all the food comes from and where the food chain goes. Basically, it's a done deal. Um, that's it really, that's the news on the uh, 24th, February 2016. And a lot of big points there. David Cameron's going to go. I would say he'll go after the EU referendum. I did another piece on how he would end up being the fall guy. Now, I did think he would voluntarily do this for the Tories. This would be the secret deal the Tories would do. You take all the flack, then we'll have a brand new leader comes in in 2018-19 before the um, general election in the UK in 2020. That fresh leader won't have all that stuff attached to them and they'll get in. So David, you do this for us and you'll be a hero. And I wonder if now that a couple of his best mates have really turned on him, in effect that's what it's turned into, I wonder if maybe David Cameron isn't feeling that generous now. And maybe is thinking, you know what, I, I, I maybe need to look after myself like Boris Johnson and Michael Gove have started to do. And of course, remember, half the cabinet, uh, the close-knit team that runs the um, country, half the Tory cabinet, the government cabinet, that inner circle, uh, have actually um, not come out yet either one way or the other. I mean, they may sort of declare a view, but that's a long way from saying... I'm keen to leave the EU or I'm keen to stay in. And you might find them thinking now about the next leader and you know, never mind what David Cameron thinks, but the next leader, they'd like to keep their job under the next leader. Now they may not, they probably won't actually, but if they think they're gonna, they're gonna try and be as bland as possible. It'll be the old bullshit, you know. Oh, it's very difficult to know at this point in time what I think about this. I'm going to do what Boris Johnson did and take it slowly and carefully, you know, and, and like not, not, I'm not going to announce my point of view until after the referendum results now. Yeah, that's the news today. Thanks for watching and listening.